I graduated in 1974, there was this, uh, and I graduated in chemical engineering. So at that time, there was this gas shortage, not unlike a few years ago. And what happened was, is that the, just like a few years ago, the prices of gas kept going up. But it was even worse then. You know, if, I live in Boston, and if you had a car, you actually had to wait in line at the gas station for about two hours to get your car filled up. But the consequence of that is that if you were a chemical engineer, you got a lot of job offers. And so pretty much every one of my classmates, um, they, they went to the oil industry. And so I thought that's what I should do too. So I applied. You, you didn't have to work that hard. I actually got 20 job offers, f f four actually from Exxon alone. <laughs> and, and, and one of them made quite an impression on me. I remember going to Exxon in Baton Rouge, and they had some people who were a few years older than me talk to me about what they were doing. And they were saying, you know, boy, if you could just increase the yield of this one petrochemical by 0.01%, they said, that would be fantastic. They said, that's worth billions of dollars. And I remember flying back to Boston that night thinking to myself that I, I really don't want to do that. You know, I just thought it was boring. And so what, I, what did I want to do? Well, when I was doing my thesis, I, I actually got involved in something else. I had spent a lot of my time as a graduate student helping start a school for poor children in Cambridge. Cambridge, people may not realize, even though it's got Harvard and MIT, in the 1970s, it had the highest dropout rate in the United States for a city its size. And so I got very interested in trying to help the school develop new chemistry and math curricula. And I was doing that. And one day, I saw an ad in a journal for being assistant professor of, to develop chemistry curriculum at City College in New York. And I thought, that's great. That's what I want to do. So I wrote them a letter applying for the job. But they didn't write me back. But I really liked the idea, so I found all the ads I could for jobs like that. I found about 40 of them. And I wrote to all these universities. And actually, none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so, so that wasn't going real well. So I started to think, what other ways can I use my background in chemical en engineering to help people? And so I thought about medicine. So I wrote to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. And they uh, didn't write back either. And then one of the people in the lab where I was, said, he said, Bob, you know, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. By the way, he also is in, in the academy uh, when he was alive. And he said, there's a surgeon in Boston named Judah Folkman. He said, sometimes he hires unusual people. <laughs> he, he actually thought very highly of, 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 of he, he thought very highly of Dr. Folkman. I won't say what he thought about me. So, 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 so anyhow, when I went, so, so I, was actually, I was actually the only engineer in Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, and I began working on two projects that were actually related. One, to see if we could actually discover the first substance that could stop cancer blood vessels from growing and hopefully then stop cancer growth. And two, to develop plastic systems, polymer systems that could slowly release these and other large molecules for a long time so that we could test uh, the, these substances. Now, before I started working on this problem, no one had been able to develop ways to continuously release these substances for a long time from biocompatible polymers. And in fact, if you look in the scientific literature, they said actually it's impossible to do that, it's possible to release these molecules. In fact, really the only thing I had going for me is, is I hadn't read that literature. <laughs> and so I I actually spent about two years working on the project, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get it to not work. <laughs> but finally, I made a discovery that I could modify certain types of plastics and get them to release these molecules over a long time. And then we used these substances to create bioassays that enabled us to discover the first substances that stopped cancer blood vessels and to help stop cancer. About two years after I started working on this polymer delivery project, I got asked to give a, a talk to a very distinguished audience of polymer scientists at, and engineers in, in Michigan, actually. And I'd never given a big talk before. In fact, the only talk that I'd really given before that one was in eighth grade. <laughs> and, and that was a minute and a half speech, and it, it didn't, didn't go real well. <laughs> I, I, I remember the night before that eighth grade speech, I uh, stood in front of my parents' mirror for about four hours, and I kept reciting it over and over again. And the next day, I got asked to get, when I got up in front of the class, I, I, you know, I started re you know, reciting it. And I did OK for the first minute and two seconds, but then I couldn't remember the next word. I just froze. So I stood up there for another minute until the teacher told me to sit down and gave me a pretty bad grade. I, I think, it, think it was an F. 
So, so now when this big talk in Michigan came many years later, I was very nervous. I kept practicing the talk over and over into a tape recorder. And finally the day came and I gave it. And I was pretty pleased by the end of the talk this time. I didn't forget too much what I was going to say. I didn't stammer too much. So I thought when I was done with this scientific talk that all these older distinguished chemists and engineers being uh, nice people, um, Actually, I should tell you, there are probably very few scientists in the audience, because usually when I say that, people know that scientists aren't always so nice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I, I thought they'd actually want to encourage me, this young guy. But actually, when I got done with the talk, a number of these scientists came up, and they said, we don't believe anything you just said. They said, you can't do that. They can't get these things through polymers. And it wasn't until several years later that people began repeating what we did to the question shifted to how um, how could this happen? And I spent a lot of my early career at MIT trying to figure that out. Also, shortly after this talk, I tried to get grant money to help uh, do uh, by different projects. And I remember uh, writing one grant to the NIH on cancer, and I got the reviews back, which were really, really negative. They not only didn't give me the money, they said, well, how could Dr. Langer do this? They said, he's a chemical engineer. He doesn't know anything about biology, and he knows even less about cancer. I wasn't sure how that was possible to know less than nothing, but somehow that was the review. Um, anyhow, also when I was done with uh, my postdoctoral work, I applied for different faculty positions to different chemical engineering departments. But when I did that, I had a lot of trouble getting a job because they all felt I wasn't doing engineering. They felt it was more biology. So I ended up joining what was uh, called the Nutrition and Food Science Department at MIT. But in that department, what happened was, uh, about a year after I got the position, the chairman of the department left. So then a number of the senior members of the department decided they'd give me advice. And their advice was I should start looking for a new job. <laughs> so, so there I was. I was getting my grants turned down. People didn't believe in my research. It appeared like I wasn't even going to get to be an associate professor. But fortunately, uh, what happened over the next few years is different uh, people in, the, in academics and in pharmaceutical companies started using a lot of our principles, and things slowly began to turn around. I also, I also wanted, and it very much in keeping with this conference, I wanted to have our inventions to get to the point where they could really help people. And it's very difficult, because it takes a lot of money to do that. So I began writing patents on our work. And today, we've licensed or sub-licensed these patents to actually 250 different companies. And, I, and actually, with my students, we even started uh, uh, about 25 companies. And I should, uh, and I should add that uh, when I first started doing this as a professor in the early 80s, uh, most academic scientists looked down upon it. They said, you know, professors shouldn't do things like that. But today, these companies have made all kinds of products that treat patients with, and I'll mention some of this, with cancer, heart disease, and many other sicknesses. They've created tens of thousands of jobs. Let me just give you two examples. In the first example, I'll just expand a little bit about what I said earlier, where we develop polymer systems that could release large molecules. One of the big challenges is getting a patent. That's actually key in a lot of scientific innovation. So we actually filed the first patent in the history of Boston Children's Hospital in 1976, and the patent office turned it down. They actually turned it down five times between 1976 and 1981. And my lawyer just said, we should give up. But I, I, I don't like to give up that easily. So I started thinking about other ways, not even scientific ways, that, that we could get the patent allowed. Noth nothing illegal. But, um, but anyhow, so what the patent examiner said, because he didn't understand the science that well, is that what we did was obvious. So I thought, how could he think that? Because every time I gave a talk on this, everybody told me it was impossible, it couldn't work. And I wondered whether scientists had ever written that down, you know, not just insult me to my face, whether they'd actually ever even written it down. So, 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 I, 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 so I scoured the literature to see if, what anybody had written on me. And actually, I found an article in 1979, a number of years after we wrote our article, that actually was very interesting, because they referred to our work. And they wrote, and I'll just give you a quote. They said, Folkman uh, and Langer. Uh, myself, have reported some surprising results, they use those words, that clearly demonstrate the opposite of what scientists had thought before. So I showed that quote to our lawyer, and he said, that's very interesting. He said, I'm going to fly down and talk to the patent examiner. And the patent examiner said to the lawyer, he said, you know, he said, I didn't realize that. He said, if Dr. Langer can get affidavits from the five people who wrote that quote, that they really wrote that quote, I will allow that patent. And so I wrote them, and all five of them were nice enough to say they really wrote it. Um, and, we, and, 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 and we got the patent. And then what we did, and I think this is also interesting, 
you know, I was pretty naive about this. I'd worked on this for nine or 10 years. Nobody was using it. But then one company and then a second company, one in animal health and one in human health, wanted to license it. And they actually gave me a consulting fee and grant money. And I was so excited about this. I, I went, you know, I got a better car and, and, and I had money to support our lab. But these companies were very large. They were multi-billion dollar companies. And what happened was, is even though they gave us m grant money at MIT, uh, uh, that, that what happened is they, they themselves would do maybe one or two experiments over a year or two, and if they didn't work out right, and in science most things don't work out right the first time, they just gave up. So a few years later, one of my friends at MIT, Alex Klebanoff, he said, Bob, why don't we just start a company ourselves? So I was able to get these patents back, and we started a little company called Enzatech, and that later merged with our downstairs neighbor to become Alchemies, and they use these microspheres to develop drug delivery systems for all kinds of drugs. It's really a hard question. I mean, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a long time. I think th that for me, I, I um, studied chemical engineering, and I, I studied it without, I think, really understanding even what it was. It was kind of something that my father and guidance counselor, you know, suggested going into engineering, and then I, you know, was better at chemistry than other things, and, and, and not terribly good in some of those other things. So I went into chemical engineering. And I went through and I did this undergraduate work, wasn't clear what I wanted to do, so I you know, kind of postponed it. I went to graduate school. And I really, what happened there, you know, pretty much all my colleagues went into the oil industry. And I interviewed at those places and I just wasn't excited about it. And so I started thinking about other jobs and eventually I, I, I wanted to do something that I felt would help people and I tried to get some education jobs but I, I wasn't able to get those. People didn't want to hire chemical engineers to do chemistry education. And then I, um, I thought of other ways I might use my education to help people and I thought about medicine. And uh, there was a man named Judah Folkman who he's actually in the academy also uh, and he was kind enough to hire me. He was a surgeon and he um, he, he um, asked me to work on certain medical projects. And for me, being in that hospital and being actually, uh, I was the only engineer, I think, in the all of Children's Hospital, just exposed me to all kinds of like different medical problems. And I could see that I could apply chemical engineering in some different ways to, to solve those problems. And so I at least knew by that time that I wanted to do that. In other words, by the time I was a postdoctoral fellow, I knew that I wanted to you know, combine, you know, kind of engineering and medicine. But exactly how I would do it, I mean, you know, that, that continued to take many years. I, I ended up becoming a professor, and, uh, but it wasn't really immediately clear to me that that was necessarily the path. But certainly the general idea of combining engineering and medicine, I mean, that came when I was, uh, you know, 25 to 28. When I was 11 years old, I had this, like, Gilbert chemistry set. To me, I've always liked magic. This has made me sound silly, but I always liked magic. And chemistry is always very magical. I mean, the kinds of things, like I remember when I was a little boy, you know, you'd have these solutions and you could, ha you could take one solution and mix it with another and all of a sudden it would change to like a third color. And you could take, mix one thing with another and it would turn like into rubber. Uh, and I thought, you know, those are reactions. And I thought, boy, this is, this is really neat. And I, I guess I was just always fascinated with that. And, and so I think you know, maybe just the visualization, even when I didn't understand things that well, I, I, I thought was fun and exciting. And then I guess when I actually took chemistry, there was something, I don't want to say magical about it, but something that, um, you know, I, I enjoyed solving the problems, that the chemistry problems, and I enjoyed, you know, reading about some of, some of the things, not all of the things. And I, I was excited about what it, what it could do. Because I think chemistry is just so fundamental you know, that, that reactions can happen and you can make things that you could never make before. And so, you you know, when you look at the world around us, I mean, chemistry just is, is so fundamental to everything. I mean, it makes the clothes you wear. It makes the all the materials that exist in, uh, you know, synthetic materials in the world, our cars, the airplanes, everything, you know, is, is, is done by chemistry. And at the same time, chemistry provides a tool to understand so many things. It, how cells work, how uh, how drugs work, you know, and and so, to me, it's it's just like such an incredibly fundamental science. 
the person that inspired me the most was Judah Folkman. I mean, it, that, he was the man that I worked with when I was a postdoctoral fellow. And, and he was, you know, really an inspirational person. I mean, for a variety of reasons. One, he was like a big thinker and lots of people told him that his ideas wouldn't work or that they were impossible. And, you know, he, you know, he persevered in spite of that and, uh, and, and, and did very, very well. And secondly, um, he was, you know, very encouraging, you know, very sort of like positive reinforcement in terms of how he would deal with me and others. Uh, and, and so I, I would say he certainly had a pivotal influence on my, my career. Um, uh, that was, like I say, when I was a postdoctoral fellow. I think the impact of no is a couple things. I mean, for me, early on, it was, it was discouraging. I mean, it was very discouraging for me to hear that. I didn't realize that scientists were like that and that people were like that. I would think that I would have thought, and I like to hope that I, you know, encourage people rather than discourage people. I mean, I think you can say no and still say, you know, boy, that might be a tough problem, but, you know, if you really work at it, you know, maybe you'll solve it rather than no, it'll never happen. Uh, but no can be very discouraging. But I think if you really believe in, in, in what you're trying to do, I mean, no is not going to stop you. It, 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 it might be discouraging, but it's still, I mean, it's just somebody saying it. It's not, it doesn't necessarily have, they don't necessarily have to be right. And I think that for me, say in Dr. Folkman's case, the fact that he had people say no and, and they weren't right. I mean, that was a very good role model for me to see. I think there's value in taking and being disciplinary, you know, doing something, you know, maybe narrow and go, but really going deep in it. But I also so think that there's incredible value in what uh, I might call convergence. That's a term we use at MIT, where you can bring disciplines together and, uh, and, and, and try to solve problems in new ways. And actually, I think what's happened at MIT and now a few other places is that, that they actually are trying to do that. So we just have a new building. Uh, that I'm in now called the Koch Institute, which is uh, aimed primarily at cancer. And half the people in the building are you know, outstanding biologists and half the people in the building are outstanding engineers. And I've seen that happen you know, a few other places too, where, like at Harvard and University of Chicago. And, and, and I think that that, uh, that that kind of idea of convergence really can enable scientists to get together in unusual ways and therefore can great, uh, create unusual things. So I think it's, it's it, so I think both things are of value. A couple years ago, uh, the National Cancer Institute put out a grant, uh, what Crest for Proposals, you know, in the area of nanotechnology and cancer. And so some of my colleagues asked if I would, you know, help put something like that together. So we got a group of really wonderful biologists at MIT and, and I asked a group of, of engineers and we got, you know, probably about 15 of us together and we came up with these ideas about like targeting nanoparticles to tumors, uh, new materials for, you know, ultra rapid diagnostics, new materials for imaging, you know, so that you might detect the cancer earlier. And, and so, so those are all really, to me, interesting examples of how you can take, uh, on the one hand, engineering and material science, and on the other hand, biology and medicine, put them together and try to create new things that can maybe someday uh, improve cancer therapy and diagnosis. And actually, we were fortunate enough to get that grant and you know, continue to get it, and I, I think it's, it's doing a lot of good. Oh boy, the human body is, is, is incredibly remarkable. I mean, I, I think we're still trying to figure out how it does. I mean, I, I, I mean, one just incredible feat is just how you start, you know, with an embryo and make a person, you know, and how do all these things happen so that, you know, cells do what's called differentiate, meaning you start, you know, with a, a it, it being sort of a, a general type cell and then somehow it becomes like a cartilage cell or bone cell and then it knows actually where to go and and how to form and what forms around it. and. I mean, to me, that's just an amazing thing that, that we have this ability to um, form these tissues and organs in such a remarkable way and, you know, most of the time do it correctly. Uh, I think that's probably one of the most 
remarkable things that I've seen. And then obviously what happens at a cellular, you know, and molecular level in any cell, I mean, that's, all, so all of that together is just, just amazing. Well, of course, I think the human body does really well. I mean, I suppose, though, you know, one could look at, at uh, uh, as, as you start to think, how could you do better? I suppose you could look at, at other species and see how they do things better. You know, so some, uh, you know, some organisms, you could chop off like a limb and it'll actually regenerate back. I mean, that's pretty good. Certainly lots of, some, lots of animals are faster than we are or stronger. Uh, so, you know, probably we'd have that, th those abilities are, are, are important too. So I think that, you know, you could probably just go down the line. I mean, some of them can fly, some can run very fast, some can regenerate themselves. So there's all kinds of things that uh, you could probably do better because they've been done better in other cases. But hard to be as intelligent, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I suppose... I suppose I enjoyed creative play somewhat. Like I say, I, I enjoyed magic. I, I mm -hmm. thought magic was just incredibly neat. I certainly wasn't um, creative like an actor or as a terrible artist. I wasn't good at music. But the one thing that I thought was fascinating to me was, was, was anything magical. And I think that probably, you know, and, and I still, still love magic. I mean, you know, I've, I've even done some magic. I'm not a great magician, but I've done like some shows and, and magic's always sort of fascinated me. So that might be the one aspect where I was, you know, a little creative. I probably did get some, you know, small magic uh, things, but, and, but, and there were lots of things though, maybe tricks, you know, so uh, it could be anything from, you know, chemistry tricks like that could change color, but I've, but for example, I've loved card tricks and there are a whole bunch of card tricks that, uh, that I think are terrific. I mean, there are card tricks where um, you can do, uh, make it seem like somebody has extra sensory perception. There's card tricks that you can, what's called the invisible pack, where there's a certain card that you will imagine that's, that's the only card that's turned upside down in the deck. And in fact, it is the only card turned upside down in the deck. But so, so those are some, I mean, but I, I, I like, you know, watching magic and, 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 and even doing it. I think my dad and my grandfather, you know, I don't know that they encouraged me to be creative per se, but they certainly encouraged me to think, you know, they encouraged me like they'd play math games with me and things like that. And I think that, uh, you know, just encouraging you to think and encourage, encouraging you in games and things like that, I think that, that probably helped some. And, and, and I think it encouraged me to, you know, want to do more and, 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 and that certainly made me like math a lot when I was young. I think probably there's certain things that are inherent, maybe genetic about creativity, but I also think that, that there are probably several elements that can help in terms of creativity too. I mean, one is probably just self-confidence. I remember when I was younger, sometimes I'd like have an idea and probably immediately I would dismiss it. I'd say like, well, how could I come up with something? But you know, as I got older, I got maybe more self-confident. And I think another thing that helps, and I think was incredibly valuable for me, was stretching myself, and not necessarily intentionally, but the fact that, say, I was a chemical engineer on the one hand, and then I would be exposed to medicine on the other hand, I'd have these two different disciplines. And, I, and, and what I would start to do, because they were so different, as I, it just occurred, you know, you'd think, well, you could combine them. And that would give me ideas probably that nobody at that time had because nobody else had that kind of background. I mean, very, very few chemical engineers, mostly they were doing oil and I was doing medicine. So I thought, well, you know, I could do something different just because I, I had, you know, this skill set and yet I saw that whole other area. And I think stretching yourself intentionally or unintentionally in, in, in new areas, seeing new things that, that people haven't seen before and yet knowing something else, you know, I, th I think that that, that that probably helped uh, me do it. So, so let, me, let me give one example, kind of a broad kind of example. So I was doing work on materials a little bit and I was in a hospital and I was curious, you know, how do materials find their way into medicine? And I was a chemical engineer. I thought, well, I was a young guy. I thought it must be chemists or chemical engineers. But as I looked into this, I found that was almost never true. When I looked at this, I found pretty much in the 20th century when I was doing work that almost every material that ever came into medicine was actually driven by a medical doctor. 
And what they pretty much always did is they, whenever they wanted to solve a medical problem, they went to their house and they found some object in their house that kind of resembled the organ or tissue from a material standpoint that they wanted to fix. So for example, in 1967, some of the clinicians at the NIH wanted to make an artificial heart. And they said, well, what object has a good flex life like a heart? And they said, a lady's girdle. And so they took the material in that and made the artificial heart out of it. That, of course, has led to some problems. When blood hits the surface of the artificial heart, it forms a clot. The clot can go to the patient's brain, they can get a stroke, and they can die. Another example is uh, one of the materials used in a, in a woman's breast implant is actually a mattress stuffing, because it's squishy. And it's a polyether ure urethane. So, a uh, polyurethane. So, I was a chemical engineer. I didn't think that way. I thought, you know, one of the things you learn in chemical engineering is kind of design. And so, what I started saying is, you know, rather than take it from your house, why don't you ask the question, what do you really want in this material from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint, biology standpoint? You know, we could put those on the board, write this out, and say, well, these are the properties I want. I'm going to then synthesize it and make it from scratch. And so that was kind of like almost this paradigm shift that I started thinking about, about how one could, you know, make new kinds of medical materials. And that would lead to new kinds of implants that we got involved in to develop to treat cancer and a whole bunch of other things. I can give more examples too, but that's a, it's kind of a high level example. I think anything in science, there's like this long road. But there are times that I can think of when there are moments that people call them in science like a aha moment or something like that where something clicks. But still, to get it to click or to get it to work, you have to do a lot more. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. One time I was watching this TV show and they were talk, showing how microchips were made in the computer industry. And I thought to myself in like an instant, boy, this would be a very neat way to, you know, do drug delivery implants, that you could actually have little chips with drugs in them and maybe multiple drugs, so you could literally, literally have a pharmacy on a chip and you could do remote control drug delivery, maybe some to even have sensors on the chip. So I had this idea. I mean, it was sort of a broad idea. Of course, then there are many, many stages to go and get it to work that take many, many years. So even though I, I had that idea, it probably took another four years of work from my, one of my students and colleagues to, to really prove that we could actually do it. And then maybe another 10 years before we actually introduced it into patients. You know, but now I think, you know, we just did the first clinical trial over the past year, you know, and it's amazing. You can actually have a cell phone that can, you know, program, uh, you know, tell the chip how much to deliver. And I expect in another 10 years, we'll see these, this kinds of ideas more widely used. And, you know, maybe in another 20 years, you'll have sensors on the chips that will actually, you know, self-tell the chips what to do in, in, in different situations. So I think, in, and, and that's just one of many examples, but I think in science, you know, there, there are places where you sort of get this idea, and, but then you have to go do it. And, and I, I could give other examples like that too, but, but, that's, a, but that's, that's sort of how it works for me, for me. I think patience is really important in science because science moves slowly. In fact, what I usually say uh, to people is some of the probably most successful scientists are the ones that know how to deal with failure well because it's easy to feel good when you succeed. I mean, that's an easy thing. But, but you're probably going to fail in science a lot more than you succeed. And so you really have to learn how to deal with it and not let it beat you. And so I think patience is, is incredibly important. I think that everybody likes quick gratification, but I think that when people really go through um, a scientific training, like doing, say, a doctoral thesis, I mean, you learn at that time, or really through any kind of research, that science moves slowly. I mean, it just can't help but do that. So I think that the instant gratification issue may, in certain cases, though I'm not certainly any expert on this, could discourage people at a younger age. But if you've gone through the kind of scientific training, like a, doing research or certainly doing a PhD, I think then you, you, you clearly learn that that's, that's something you live with, that that's just the way it is. And you know, in fact, that's part of the value of a PhD. It's, it, it teaches you how to do research, kind of what's, what science is all about. But it may be somewhat discipline dependent. I mean, I think more about, you know, 
biology and chemical engineering and chemistry and but you know maybe there's areas like computer science where it's it's a little bit different because you could do different things but i but certainly in the areas that i'm most familiar with um i think when you go through this you know whole doctoral program you 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 learn that that's just the nature of things i don't know that you can teach creativity though i'm certainly no expert i do think you can foster it i think that you can foster it in a couple of ways one way is that you can combine different disciplines. You know, like I was saying before, you, you can combine, if somebody learns, if somebody learns um, A and A, and then they learn B, and A and B are very, very different from each other, I think that helps foster it, I really do. I think that they'll, that, that people might put things together in very different ways if they do that. I also think that you can tell people you can try to let people know by, by role models and let them know that failure is fine. You know, I mean, I think people, a lot of people are afraid to fail and, and, and I think it's important for people to realize just how often you are gonna fail if you try to do things that are a bit unusual or creative. So I think that there, there are a number of things that can be done, uh, probably even beyond those things, but those are some examples of, I think, how you can foster creativity, you know, just, uh, you know, and also I think a third way is just putting people together in very different groups. In other words, if you put a group of of people with very dis different backgrounds and disciplines together, and you get them talking, uh, and they're bright and they're told like you know you can do anything, I think that also probably will encourage creativity. So I think there's a number of things that can encourage it. Some of social media probably dampens it. I'm just thinking as a, as a dad, you know, it's like you see your kids on all these things and communicating that way and when probably they could be doing other things. So I think in that way, it, it, it dampens it. On the other hand, I think some of the social media in its own right is creative and I think communication with different kinds of people over different kinds of things can also encourage creativity. So I think it can really, really go both ways. I think creativity can stagnate. I think, so there's this creative instant or instances, and then there's the long road of taking that idea and, and, and making it happen. And it's kind of like what, you know, Thomas Edison once said, you know, there's like 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I think, sadly or whatever, I mean, both end up being important. I mean, the 99% perspiration is, is also really key because just coming up with the creativity, if you don't do all the hard work to then nurture it, develop it, I mean, that, you know, then, then it won't happen. So I think both, so I think it can stagnate, but I think, you know, both, both those things end up being important. I think to nurture it, you probably want to create environments that, where just I, that ideas are valued. Um, I mean, universities are a pretty good example of that. They're companies, I think it's been tougher. I mean, you know, because somehow you have to have those ideas also lead to have a profit. There have been classically some wonderful places, like Bell Labs, for example, is a tremendous place where they had creativity. But, and, uh, you know, and I think even in the computer area, you know, uh, Xerox Park was a tremendous place for, for where creative things happen. On the other hand, what happened is the companies that sort of allowed those to happen didn't capitalize on them and didn't have a way to t sort of take the creative ideas and make a profit so that they ended up not existing anymore. So I think that, that, uh, that, that it probably depends on, on, on the situation. I feel really lucky. I mean, being at MIT, you know, you get wonderful students and postdocs and you get great collaborators. And to me, it's just a great place. I mean. And, and, and I feel like if I look at our lab, it's, it, there's just so many people, you know, I try to create an environment where I've got all different, you know, maybe we have about 10 people with about 10 different disciplines, everything from cell and molecular biologists to all different kinds of engineers, chemical engineers, electrical engineers, material scientists, you know, to a bunch of different kind of medical doctors, you know, in different specialties. And, you know, I have them all working together. And I think that in an environment like that with just bright people, very different backgrounds, 
and you know they're coming to my office and they're talking together and it, it things just kind of happen and and same thing in the building we have you know all kinds of even people with with very broad and different backgrounds like in biology and so I, th I think the way it works for me is I end up being exposed to just so many smart people with different ideas that w that I will take chances and you know it, you can't help but be stimulated by that. This woman, Helen Pearson from Nature, wrote actually a, d a day in my life, uh, and, and so she followed me around, and uh, she 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 did a very good job. I mean, she started early in the day and went to the end of it. And of course, what you see in that day is, um, you know, an awful lot of people coming in the office from all over the world, you know, usually for advice on one thing or another. And then I give lectures, and and uh, you know, and she even talks about what kind of ice cream I, I eat. Um, so a typical day is probably, you know, lots of meetings and stuff. But if it's an idea, you know, that we're developing, what what might happen is I I might talk to some of the people in the lab, maybe have them come in the office and brainstorm with them and say, well, you know, there's here's a problem that we need to solve or need to solve better. And uh, so so just as an example, when I had this idea that we could create better materials. I got about four or five people together with different backgrounds, chemistry, engineering, uh, safety, toxicology, and we started putting chemical structures on the blackboard and say, well, you know, this might work or this might not be safe and, uh, you know, and ended up with certain structures that we thought would be good. And then, you know, one of the guys would go out and try to make those structures and we'd go from there. Well, I think roadblocks, so, so this gets into the inspiration and perspiration issues. Roadblocks are probably things that come up more in the perspiration issues because you, you have this idea and you want to go down it and you obviously in science, you're going to run into roadblocks. And I think you have to just say, like, it's going to happen. And actually, it'll probably take some creativity to overcome those roadblocks if you're doing something in chemistry. I mean, you might try like one synthetic route, may not work, then maybe you'll try another. Or in our case, one of the things that we did is we created something uh, called uh, high throughput ways of doing things, which means that, you know, we know a, certain, a lot of things aren't going to work, so we're going to do thousands of them. And we'll find ones, you know, something that works out of those thousands. And so there's different strategies that you can use. And in, in and of themselves, those might be creative because they weren't done before or you're going at them in a whole new way. And I think you have to start thinking that way, you know, and so you'll come up with creativity to hopefully overcome those roadblocks. But you can never give up. I think life experience plays a significant role in creativity in a couple ways. One is that if you have areas that are very different, I think you may put them together in different ways. And again, if you've lived longer, you, you just might say, well, gee, you know, I, I remember um, seeing this and I remember seeing that, and, and, and maybe I'll give you another example in just a second. And so I think that that's one way. And I think a second way that life experience is helpful is, is, is the recognition that things take time, you know, that they're not fast and that failure often can happen. But I'll, let me uh, give an example of uh, sort of for me about a life experience and how I, I got an idea once. And, and so I, you know, did things on materials and, and I also knew something about medicine. So, I'd, you know, these two different backgrounds. So I remember about 12 years ago, I, um, and I always like to do, I'm a, kind of a multitasker too. So I remember I was uh, about 12 years ago, I got asked to give this speech to the American Heart Association. And I had a couple hours before I uh, had to give the speech, so I went to the gym, and I and I always wanted to, you know, so I like to read something. So I just picked up the nearest magazine. It was Life magazine, and they were talking about cars of the future, and they were saying that in the future, if a car gets in an accident uh, and has a big dent in it, all you'll have to do is heat it up, and the dent will snap back into place. So I saw that, and I thought to myself. Um, they're talking about materials that can actually change shape if you apply a certain type of stimulus like heat. So then I thought of something totally different when I was thinking about that because I, 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 even though I was not a surgeon, I knew something about surgery. 
And there, so there's this whole area that's evolved over the last 20 or 30 years called minimally invasive surgery. And you might think, what could that possibly have to do with cars? And actually, it doesn't have anything, but you'll, but, but what I thought about is like 30 years ago, for example, if you had a gallbladder operation, they'd make a big incision in you and they'd pull the gallbladder out. Now, what they do is they make a little incision in you uh, and the gallbladder, you'd pull it out through these little scopes. But the difference to the patient is in the first case, with the big operation, you'll be you know, in the hospital for many, many days, won't be back to work for many, many weeks or months. Second case, you're out of the hospital in a day or less and you're back to work right away because they made a tiny incision rather than a big incision. So I started thinking, you know, there's all these medical devices that people implant, you know, that get implanted in patients, many of which are just made out of material. And I thought, what if we could make a material that could change shape? So we could start out with like, with less of something that's like a string at room temperature, for example. And then you could actually put that string at room temperature through the little hole that you made. But when it gets to body temperature, which is a lot hotter, it could change into whatever shape you want, like a whatever medical device, like a stent uh, to mm -hmm. keep blood vessels open or a sheet to prevent adhesions or, or something else. So, um, so I thought, well, we should be able to make materials that actually had the property that they were talking about in the car, but if we could do it, um, uh, that maybe we could change a whole paradigm for um, you know, medical device implantation. So it was putting two very, very different areas together that I, that I happened to, one I happened to just read about instantaneously and another that I, I probably wouldn't have known if, if I hadn't been in a, in, a, in a surgery lab and maybe a third thing, just the fact that I knew something about materials. I probably don't necessarily think about somebody being sick or anything like that. I mean, and I also probably don't know the human body nearly as well as a doctor knows about it. You know, I, I probably think about it in a lot of ways, I think, like just any regular person. But maybe I also think a little bit about it, you know, that the body probably is an incredibly good engineer. It's, uh, you know, or different parts of the body, you know, are able to do, you know, some amazing things. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of chemistry going on in the body too. So maybe, you know, I impart some of my background uh, in terms of how I might think about some of it. I remember years ago, teaching about how the kidney worked. And part of that was to realize that there's all these tubes and all this kind of transportation of different substances going through it. You know, and it's just part of, I think, what they wanted me to impart was, you know, that the kidney is kind of an amazing engineering feat, and yet it's in your body. I think about two kinds of contributions that I, that I make. One is the training of people. And I, I, I like to think that, you know, we've kind of trained like a whole generation of biomedical engineers that have become experimentalists that make new things. And to that end, there's probably close to 250 people who have come from my lab who are now professors all over the world doing just that. And they've done terrific. I mean, many are department heads, deans, and then there's probably another maybe 250 or so that went to companies, started companies, you know, created different kind of bioengineering inventions and products and, um, you know, that helped change the world. And so I think that the training of people is one set of contributions. And then the other set of contributions are probably the ideas and the inventions, the, the, what, the fact that you can use materials to uh, come up with whole new ways of maybe getting drugs into cells or maybe making drugs a lot safer or make them work a lot better. <clears throat> and, 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 you know, the ideas of using nanotechnology in medicine. And then this whole idea that uh, Jay Vacanti and I came up with about use combining polymers and, and mammalian cells to create new tissues and organs, you know, which is tissue engineering. So I think that, that, that both kinds of things, the training of individuals and then, you know, real specific ideas that might ultimately, in, in some cases, have led to new kinds of, of products that help, help people. To me, when people leave the lab, I mean, the way I think about it <clears throat> is that there's a couple sets of skills. One is how to take a problem from the beginning to end, uh, and it's often a long road, but how you take a problem from beginning to end, uh, from framing the questions to coming up with the answers. But also, I, I hope that when they're there, they, they, they think about big questions, you know, that they 
want to leave there and not do things that are incremental, but that are things that, that are really big and maybe can have a huge impact on the world. And, and then I also hope that they've grown as a, as a person, that they realize that, that, you know, they've learned how to work with individuals better, they've learned how to deal with scientific frustration better, that they've learned how to communicate better, both in writing and in speaking. Um, and so, so all of that. So polymers in, in medicine, I mean, pretty much any medical device uses materials and, and sometimes materials make it possible to even create a medical device. Uh, if, and, 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 and in many cases, we haven't even created the right ones yet. I mean, so I think, you know, if you, if you wanna prevent adhesions, if you wanna prevent certain forms of blindness, uh, materials can play a critical role and we probably can do better than, than we have. Uh, materials can also play a critical role in this whole area of tissue engineering where you can make you know, some new artificial skin now and, and, and maybe someday new spinal cords for paralyzed people, new vocal cords, new intestines, all those things. And, and, and many others, materials play a key role. Nanotechnology is really at an earlier stage. Nanotechnology, though, offers the possibility of getting, of doing a number of things. First, it, because there's particles are tiny, they're tiny enough that you can actually use them to carry different drugs to cells. So someday, for example, I hope in the not too far future, you might be able to deliver a cancer drug to just the cells you want, like a cancer cell, and not to other cells. Someday, I hope in the not too far future, you could take possibly new kinds of medicines that people are trying to develop that specifically knock out certain genes and get them into a cell. But I don't limit it to just to therapy. I also think it can be useful in imaging agents so that you could make better imaging agents so that you could detect disease <coughs> like cancer earlier. And finally, <coughs> I think you could uh, do diagnostics much more rapidly because, again, uh, nanotechnology enables particles to be very small, so you could put certain things on them. And because the surface area is so great compared to larger particles, you may be able to amplify certain signals, and therefore you could detect uh, a certain diseases much more rapidly. So we're actually working on a project with a company where like if somebody has a bacterial infection, now it might take five days to, to, to know what it is and to treat it. But I hope that when we're done, it'll take an hour and maybe someday in the future, even less. I think a lot of these new discoveries that we're involved in and that many other scientists are involved in will change how people think about medicine. I mean, people are talking about, for example, personalized medicine, you know, and, 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 you know, where we understand the genome better and that could lead to new treatments. And some of the things that we're talking about with tissue engineering where you could make new tissues or organs could provide all kinds of potentially new treatments. So I think it will, as we move forth in the future, lead to new kinds of thinking about medical treatment. I think medical training is important as well because I think that as you come up with new kinds of therapies, it's, it's very important for people to realize what's happening, what's gonna happen. And of course, what's wonderful is a lot of the medical training for some people, you know, a lot of clinicians that I work with, I mean, they're a big part of actually creating this, this new frontier, you know, of tissue engineered products, of nanotechnology. And, you know, so they're, they're the ones that are helping push, push forward these things, both from basic research and, and actually clinical trials and things like that. I remember early on when I was doing this postdoctoral work and the goal was to see if we could ever find a substance, you know, none existed before or nobody had ever found one that could stop blood vessels from growing. And this was something we thought would potentially lead to a new way of stopping cancer. And we didn't really know, you know, it was a, sort of a theory that my advisor, Dr. Folkman had. And I remember we did these studies where we put tumors in, in these animals and we could actually visualize the blood vessels. And I remember what happened is we were infusing the substance. I must have spent a year isolating it. Um, and we were infusing the substance and we're looking at the vessels grow. So in the control animal that just got a regular solution, when it started, there were um, hardly any blood vessels. And in the example, and yet the treated one that we started with, there were actually quite a few. And so this was say at day four in both cases. So you look at it at day five, and 
you start to see the, the one with very few blood vessels in the control starting to catch up a little by day six. It was maybe the same by day seven, there were a lot more. By day eight, quite a lot more, and by ten, day 10, you know, it was, the control was very, very large in terms of blood vessels, and yet the treated animal still was right where it was before, you know, had, 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 and, and, and that was an incredibly exciting moment because you could see uh, each of those days was actually exciting because you could see before your eyes that something did exist, you know, and you could visualize it. I mean, see it with your eyes that this was really happening and that substances would exist that could stop blood vessels from growing. And, that, you know, so, and, and ultimately that would lead to a whole new class of molecules. But, I mean, that was, that was a long time ago, but it was very exciting. I think one of the great challenges and great frontiers is what I'll call regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much that needs to be done in that area, and I think it offers so much potential. I mean, right now we think about drugs <clears throat> almost always when we're thinking about treating a patient, but you really can't treat somebody um, if they're dying of liver failure. I mean, you need to transplant. You really, if somebody has a bad heart. I mean, you, you can't do that much. Someday you'll be able to make new tissues and organs. And that to me is just a gigantic step forward in, in terms of every part of your body. And that would be a whole new paradigm. Um, that would be great. And it's a huge challenge, but it's a huge frontier. It's not to me about necessarily living that long. It's just li living better. I mean, the tragedy in it is that sometimes it's young people who have these problems. Mm -hmm. And you, you see, um, you know, so I look at most of, of the idea of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering as helping people who, you know, might not live the kind of lives, well, first of all, might not live at all, and secondly, have a better life. I mean, could you make uh, an artificial pancreas so that people, diabetics, wouldn't get complications, go blind, uh, have to give shots every day? Could you, um, you know, make uh, a new liver so that people wouldn't have to have a transplant and take immunosuppressives all the time and, and, and maybe die? Uh, can you prevent diseases like even uh, ALS and things like that? I mean, I, th I think you could go on and on. <clears throat> and so to me, it's, it's, it's really stopping problems like that, that you just want people to have health, happier, healthier lives. And, and sometimes they're accidents. So we have a big project, for example, with the Army, uh, Dr. Vacanti and myself, where people come back, you know, again, young people from Afghanistan or Iraq, and they have, don't have ears and things like that. So you could make, you know, new cartilage for them. I mean, so I think there's so many situations that you want to help people. And, you know, and, and that, I think, is the main reason that you want to see these things happen. But it may, you know, also lead to healthier lives at, at any stage. There was a famous uh, politician that was asked the question, this is going to sound a little bit provincial for people not in the United States, but it's still a good story. But, there was a, but he was asked, um, what are the three most important things in history? And he said the three most important things in history were the founding of America, um, the... Um, the printing press, and he said the patent system. And that man was Abraham Lincoln. And I think his thinking about that was that patents in general, which last for a finite amount of time, give people an, an opportunity to have an invention and use it, and yet not use it forever, so it would encourage innovation. So, I, I, and, and I think that that's right. I think there are plenty of things that can, can be fixed. Uh, and, and probably that'll continue to happen over, over many years. But to me, they're small in the scheme of, of the fact that in the end, if it's not broke, you don't fix it. And I think that the patent system by and large is good. I mean, the kinds of things I think you, you, you want to fix are, to me, almost simple things. Like I think that you want to have money go into the patent system so that examiners don't, you know, I've had patents take 10 years to get allowed. And I think that's not good, I mean, for me or anybody. So I think you want to have these things looked at faster. I think you want to have more experienced patent examiners who can really judge science and the claims. And there, there are plenty of other things, too. But by and large, I still think it's, it's quite good. I think 
you know, educating young people is, is in, in step, it's just such a, a critical thing. And, and I, I, to me, the kinds of things that I think about are, are improving the quality of science teachers, you know, trying to provide, you know, uh, better incentives for people to, to want to become teachers uh, of young people. I also think it is developing better curricula that can make real life examples to people so that young people can see that science can be really exciting and can do wonderful things. And I do think, and this relates to the earlier question, that the media can play an unbelievably important role uh, in, in terms of educating everybody in the country and the world about how exciting and all the good, good things that science and, and engineering can do. And of course, you know, unfortunately, so many times, you know, it, you know, what's in the papers and other things are murders and Hollywood movie stars and stuff like that. I'd love to see more creativity put forth on, you know, things that would encourage ed education, science and things like that. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done both directly and indirectly. I think both big companies and small companies play important roles. But for me as a, somebody who works at a university, and who, who often does things that might not go along with, say, conventional wisdom. And when I come up with ideas um, that are very early stage, I found that small companies, you know, can take things a lot farther. I think with big companies, one of the concerns is that, I mean, th there's just a lot of people in them. And so I think it's, it's not impossible, but it's often harder to, to take a, an odd idea and and innovate and make it happen. There's just plenty of people above that person that can say no uh, and tell them it's not gonna work or you shouldn't do it. I think at a small company, there's fewer people that can do that. And people have the passion to take early stage ideas and, and, and make them into products that, that can make a difference. So I, I think that small companies can play an incredible role in innovation in terms of taking you know, ideas that are, are early stage and, and, and making them real and making them happen. Uh, but probably you need, I think you need both because if you don't have the big companies, again, in medicine, I mean, it's very, very expensive to do human clinical trials. It's very expensive to, you know, get a product through the FDA and, and out to patients. And I think the big companies play an incredible role on that. And, and also, sometimes the way science works, you, you really want I mean, you need hundreds of people working on something to solve a problem, and big companies can, can do that too. So I think both, I think there's been a, a great role for both of them. I think it depends how you look at it. I think, I, I think that invention, I mean, and there's different kinds of inventions. I mean, Thomas Edison, you know, did things like light bulbs that you could see immediately whether they might work or not, uh, you know. Whereas some of the things that, you, you know, when you're trying to make new drugs or medical devices, it may take a long time to see if it works. But I think that, invent, that, that, that at a high level, the, what you see are people, when they do invention, are people with, sometimes with like courage of, to, to sort of pursue their ideas, that the courage to think that it's, it's okay to think out of the box and, and then the persistence and drive to take those ideas and, and keep fighting and fighting till you make them happen. And so in, in, in that larger sense, I, I, I don't know that anything's necessarily changed because that's the larger sense is human nature. Nature is incredibly smart and uh, in, in, in every way. And so I think, um, I think that that, but that I think is also a good thing. I mean, because we can learn from nature. You know, and if we're able to unlock the secrets of nature, we can also, you know, invent even better things. So I think I think it cuts both ways. Uh, I, I think we can learn so much from what happens in nature. You know, right now we're, you know, and maybe always we won't be as smart as, as, as nature, but we can see what happens in nature and to start to learn those things, you know, make discoveries that can just have profound effects on, on human life. I always like reading and even seeing TV shows on like biographies of people, mm -hmm. you know, and th that could be sports people, it could be, 
scientists or politicians or, 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 or anyone. I always find that inspiring. I, I, you know, I think it's interesting to me to see how people make things happen. You know, and I think you always learn from that. I mean, and, and I think you get inspired from it. I mean, you know, there, there, there are all kinds of stories, and I think that they kind of reinforce the idea that it's okay to fail, that it's that you keep struggling and that you keep persisting, you know, no, no matter what. And they may be stories of people very, very different than me and, and stories of people who do things that are very, very different, but it doesn't matter. I still, I, I love reading those things and, and, and seeing those stories. And there are a lot of people I found interesting and inspiring. I, I, I'll just pick one example that's very, very different, but I just thought was interesting that I never would have thought that I would have enjoyed that much, which was uh, Milton Hershey, you know, who started Hershey's Candies. But what was amazing to me when I read the book on him is that, you know, I think he wanted to start like a candy store, you know, about nine or 10 times. And every time he tried, he failed, you know, I mean, and finally, of course, he succeeded. But what was interesting was just the persistence. And then, of course, he he made it terrific. And by the way, I don't even like Hershey's chocolate that much, but I just thought it was such an interesting thing to see, you know, and then he set up all these orphanages and things like that. But I just thought that stories of, of uh, incredible persistence, uh, and, and there's, there, there are lots. I mean, I think, you know, stories of Abraham Lincoln, I, I, I you know, I certainly have found inspiring, and, 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 and really many, many people. I mean, but I think the struggle, the watching of how they, they, they do things, um, you know, to me, it's always it's, it's always interesting. And you know, Thomas said it. But there's lot there's lots of people. When I graduated um, college, uh, graduate school, you know, the natural thing was to go into the oil industry, and obviously that that certainly could have been something I would do. I thought about it when I went to the interviews. That's almost what everybody did, and that seemed like the norm. So I thought about it. That might have been one thing, but I clearly went through that analysis and decided I wouldn't do it. So some of the things I, I thought about when, you know, and I ended up taking a postdoctoral job at, at the hospital, but some of the things I talk, thought about actually were almost silly things like take a year off because I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do and work in an ice cream parlor because I always liked ice cream. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I did get one other faculty job, uh, actually a couple, but one faculty job I, I thought about a little bit was I got asked uh, to be an assistant professor of what's called enology and viticulture at the University of California at Davis. And my dad actually ran a liquor store when I was a little boy, and so that intrigued me, but I decided I wasn't going to do that either. But, that, but those are all possible paths that I, I, I could have gone down. To me, the American dream means that you can do anything you want, anything you, you dream of. I mean, I think in particular, one of the wonderful things I think about, you know, in terms of the American dream, is that somebody can be born, you know, with nothing, you know, or into adversity, and they can rise up and change the world, you know, could be to create a company, make a, dis a great discovery. Uh, I particularly think about people who might have had very minimal education, uh, you know, that they're born poor, and yet that they could dream and actually accomplish, you know, creating companies that are, you know, incredible. And, you know, you see those things happen. When I was an undergraduate, actually, at Cornell, mm -hmm. I um, got asked to be, I was a teaching assistant when I was a senior, and I loved it. I, I, uh, I just love working with the students. I mean, they were a year younger than me, but I could see that I could make a difference. And so when I came to Boston, I wanted to think about ways that I could do teaching and tutoring. And so the first year I was there, I got involved in some tutoring at, at, at places like Roxbury where there were poor kids, and I, and I loved that too. And then my second year as a, as a graduate student, there was a group of people wanting to start a school for poor kids in Cambridge. Cambridge, oddly enough, has, you know, at that time, even though it has Harvard and MIT in it, had the highest high school dropout rate in the country for a city its size, 35%. 35%. And so they asked me if I would help on math and science because they knew of some of the tutoring I did. And I love that too. I, I, just, uh, I just really you know, enjoyed working with the kids and coming up with ideas about how I could make math interesting and chemistry interesting. A great teacher probably could do a couple things. Number one, I think it's important that 
the students recognize that the teacher probably really cares about them, you know, however they do it, that, that, that they're, they're doing it and that, they, that the teacher really care. But I also think there's a, a number of other skills that such a person can have. I think it's important that they can make things interesting and ideally make them even relevant to what the kids are, are interested in. Uh, and I think it's important that over the course of a term, however long the person's teaching, that you have a, a, a program, you know, whether it's in a textbook or, or lessons, you know, that, that they can learn something and feel that they've completed it and, 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 and really come away feeling that I've learned chemistry or physics or Engli English or some, you know, some aspect of it. So I think all those things. It does concern me that the United States isn't doing as well in things like particularly math and science education as, as some other countries. And I think part of it is um, due, some of it's just due to resources that I don't know that we put as much into, you know, teaching at, you know, in terms of financial resources at, to, to kids, to teachers at lower, at younger levels, like at, I'm not, young, yeah, like uh, grammar school teachers and high school teachers. I think part of it is also the media. I think the media, you know, glamour, especially in our country, uh, really glamorizes, um, you know, movie stars and athletes far more than, you know, science and math. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I suppose that's natural, but other countries don't necessarily do that the same way, I think. Um, you know, it's uh, sometimes things like science and math or, and engineering, which is what I do, they're held in much higher respect or higher regard in some other countries than in our own. And so I think that media can play a, a, a tremendous role in that too. And so you, you, you'd like to think that as a country, we make more concerted efforts to you know, give teachers the best training, to give them the best rewards possible, and that the media, uh, you know, hopefully in some way work harder to communicate just how great these things can be to young people. I don't think I was a gifted child. I don't know. I, I, I never thought of myself like that. And I, I don't think I think of myself like that now. You know, I, I've just kind of thought of myself as a, as, as, as a pretty regular person. And then I, you know, was fortunate to, you know, do okay in, in college and high school. But then I found this kind of niche, you know, that I made this decision to do something very, very different as a postdoctoral fellow after my graduate work, you know, that people hadn't done anything like that before. And I think that going down that path, I mean, it's kind of a way, it's kind of like I took the road less taken. And as, you know, and that did for me make all the difference. And I, so I, I don't think I've ever been gifted, but I put myself in a position, maybe by good fortune or maybe because I, I thought a little bit differently, that enabled me to see things differently. And, and I think that's been the main chain difference. I think you can make that choice any time in your life. I mean, maybe it helps to be naive, but, uh, and I certainly was. But I, I really do believe, I mean, people can make that choice any time. And sometimes it may be that somebody goes through a career and, and they get to a certain point and, and they say they're going to change. I think the harder thing for them is if you try to change at 50 or 60, the world is maybe less willing to you know, put you in a position where you can do those things. But I think anybody can, can, can do anything. I mean, that is part of the American dream. It just, it's just, you may have to struggle that much more if, if you do it later. For me as a scientist, the journey to here has been one of, of for me, of trying to dream big dreams. But, but one of the things I realize when you do this is that a lot of times, and this is not just true for science, it's probably true in any area, that when you try to dream dreams that can help change the world and, and help people and, and think about things like this, that a lot of times people will tell you that your idea is impossible, your invention is impossible, it could never work. But I think that's very rarely true. I think if you really believe in yourself, if you're persistent and work hard, that there's very little that's truly impossible.